I'm here, the MECFS alert, with Dr. Vincent Lombardi, who is. Pleasure to meet you. It's very nice to meet you, who is head director of the clinical lab for the Whittemore Peterson Institute. This does diagnostic work and work on biomarkers that a physician would be able to order up to help with diagnosis of MECFS. And also, he's doing basic research going forward on some of the immune uh, events in chronic fatigue syndrome, such as interferon. And we wish you the best of luck with so all much. of that. Thanks so much for coming by. Well, this is Vincent Lombardi, who's directing the lab operations, the clinical lab operations, at the Whittemore Peterson Institute. And I know you came to Nevada to uh, do your graduate work at UNR next door to the Whittemore Peterson. And can you tell us how they uh, came upon you and how you ended up here? Well, actually, while I was, before I came here, I was working on the East Coast at Temple University. Oh. I met some people who were involved in chronic fatigue research. Ah. So then when I came out here, I was doing my graduate work, and I, at the same time, actually towards the end of my graduate work, I had set up a small laboratory. Mm -hmm. And then I was contacted by the people at Temple, and they said that they have a friend who I knew who wanted to set up a clinical laboratory and asked me if I'd be interested in doing that. So ah. we took my existing laboratory and expanded that into a clinical laboratory. And then I met the people who, at that point, I met the people who had founded the institute here and they became investors in the original clinical laboratory. Uh -huh. Now, unfortunately, the real clinical, the clinical laboratory has never really made any money, but they felt it was important for the patients. So, um, so we, even though it was a kind of a losing venture, they kept... Uh, was that Red Lab? That was Red Lab, yeah. Ah. And so they kept funding the institute, or the, the clinical laboratory, and then ultimately they decided that when they had the institute up and running that they wanted to have its own clinical laboratory. Mm. So we basically just you know stopped, ceased operations in the laboratory there, and then we just built a new laboratory here. Well, now part of your job is, I don't know if it is already or is going to be, to uh, put out the biomarkers so that physicians can easily decide if the myalgic encephalitis chronic fatigue syndrome is what the patient has. Now, do we feel or do you feel that one has a definitive biomarker now that you can use? So I, I believe that the biomarkers, although we've made progress in the biomarker area, it's got some work to do still. Um, one of the pieces of work that I did was looking at um, cytokine profiles in chronic fatigue syndrome, and that work was able to accurately distinguish chronic fatigue from healthy controls about 95% of the time in that group we were looking at. And mm -hmm. it happened to be that when we were doing the XMRV research, they all corresponded to XMRV, and so that work was published as an XMRV cohort of chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. Now, in actuality, that work was done before I ever knew XMRV existed. Yeah. Um, so it would really stand on its own, at least based on the cohort of patients that we have. So certainly that could be extended on perhaps other subgroups of chronic fatigue syndrome, but that's just one thing. But we are making progress in the biomarker field, and, and we are doing some new work that could also extend that based on the original discovery we've made mm -hmm. doing the cytokine work. So one of the things that we're, that I'm, it's one of my focuses that I'm interested in is looking at the interferon pathway. And so in the um, cytokine work that I did, yeah. I identified that contrary to popular, popular belief, the chronic fatigue people I was looking at actually had lower interferon than healthy people. Oh, isn't that interesting? You know, it's been published a few places where they've seen spikes of interferon in chronic fatigue mm -hmm. people, so it was assumed that chronic fatigue people had higher interferon. And when you look at maybe a certain point in time, you might see um, most people, even the chronic fatigue people, look like they have normal interferon, and once in a while you'll see a spike of interferon increase. Um, but that's because most laboratory tests to consider a value of interferon um, at a normal level, and anything below it is normal, all the way down to zero. But by doing the work that, that, that I did, I was able to 
use a large enough group of patients, a large enough group of controls that I could actually look and see what is the lower level. And even though you would see some people have high interferon from time to time, mm -hmm. the general trend for chronic fatigue people is actually lower than healthy people. Now that could actually that could have some some broad uh, some broad ramifications for the disease because the interferon pathway is part of the innate immune system, mm -hmm. and it's the first line of defense we have against things like viral infections and things like that. It was published uh, a few years ago by some people in Japan, I believe, that it's important to have a, a basal level of interferon to prime the innate immune system to respond quickly. And oh. if you don't have that basal level of interferon, then you might have a, a, dis a dysregulation and you may not be able to respond to pathogens as effectively. And so that could account for some of the things that we see in chronic fatigue syndrome. They have difficulty dealing with just normal infections of, of, of compared to other people. Well, thank you very much, and I'll look forward to sending you some blood. Oh, thanks. <laughs>